Morning Hillcrest, welcome to church today. We're glad that you have joined us online because that's just how we roll. We are glad that you are here. Hope that your week has been a good week. We've been looking forward to today because it is a brand new series. And there's some there's some really unique or different things that we're going to do during this series. Uh, being, uh, you know, online or doing streaming services uh, gives us an opportunity to do some things differently. It also creates a few challenges for things like we're used to doing them. But nonetheless, uh, we are going to be working through um, this series in which we are uh, talking about this thread of redemption that moves from, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And uh, I've got a special guest that you're going to meet later today that's going to share a little bit about his connection into this uh, this series, and really, I guess, how this series came about uh, as a result of that connection. So, some things to look forward to today. Hope that you were able to catch Hillcrest Live this last Thursday. We were having a lot of fun on Thursday night, so uh, come on out, be a part of that. If you miss it on Thursday night, because, I don't know, uh, who do I compete with on Thursday? Is there anything going on Thursday night on television? Worship practice. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's you know, everything's de no. everything is is streamed online anyways. You know, your Netflix shows will still be there. So, 7 o'clock. But if you're out taking a walk, you're with the family, I get it. But come join later. Uh, but we have a lot of stuff that we do, uh, you know, directly online um, together. So, uh, if you want to be a part of that, you can do that. And we would love to have you there with that. Today, uh, as the beginning of the message starts... There's going to be some polls that you're going to engage in. So what's going to happen is as you're watching this live stream, a poll is going to pop up and then you're going to interact with that poll and then it's going to go away and then another poll will pop up and so on and so forth. So uh, that is coming up at the beginning of the message. So just kind of prepare you for that. Take a moment right now and greet those around you. Say hi to someone. Tell everyone you're online. Say, I'm here. Say hi to various people as they're coming on. And that way, um, you know, everybody can kind of see who's there and start some interaction and chat and talk with one another. So go ahead and, uh, and do that at this moment. And as uh, you're doing that, we are going to uh, move right into our first worship set today. So again, welcome to Hillcrest. Glad that you're here. Kelsey, team.
Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, worship team. Happy birthday to Christy Bauer. Happy birthday to you, Christy. Thanks for having a birthday and thanks for watching today. So Tuesday is Cinco de Mayo, and we've got our resident Spanish-speaking friend running the tech here today, Vaughn Kirkland. And so uh, this Tuesday, it's also Quarantine de Mayo. So in the comments, we want to know what your go-to have-to-have topping on a taco is. Is it cheese? That. While you're doing that, a few announcements for you today. Hillcrest Live coming at you live this Thursday with Pastor Doug at 7 o'clock p.m. He's apparently going to be cutting his hair on the show. And to have some fun, we're going to raffle off the opportunity for you to cut Pastor Doug's hair. So the highest bidder gets to shave his head. Wow. Yeah, talk to Vaughn. Check, check in with him on that. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Some sad news to report to you, uh, Tyler Kopp, TK, our student ministries coordinator, is leaving us on Friday, May 15th to pursue a full-time opportunity at a different church in Harrisburg. So we are uh, really sad to see he uh, and Andrea leave, but Friday uh, the 15th, we're having a kind of a social, social distancing farewell parade for him, 6 to 7 p.m. on our parking lot. You can find details uh, in the info email, also on Facebook as well. Finally, business meeting is coming up Sunday, May 17th. We're going to be doing that meeting through the Facebook group, that private group that we have set up. So if you are not a member of that, I know there's been maybe one or two of you that have had a challenge joining that. If you're not a member of that, uh, let me know. Send me an email, brian at siouxfallschurch.com. We'll make sure that you are part of that group so you can join us for that business meeting. All right, Kelsey, back to you.
But God, you are bigger than we thought you were. And you're bigger than we thought you were a day ago, a week ago, certainly months and a year ago. And Father, may that truth that you are bigger than we imagine, bigger than we could possibly conceive, bring us comfort and draw us closer to you today. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather wherever we are, whoever we're with, in our living rooms, on our phones, on our computers, throughout the country, throughout the world. We are grateful to worship you this morning. And as Pastor Doug comes and opens up your word to us today, may you open up our hearts to hear what you have to say to us. May we find truth and find ways that we can live out that truth tomorrow and in the week to come. And Father, as we give to you, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to give to you of our time and our talent and our treasure. And we pray that you would use it to bring people closer to who you are. And we pray these things in your name. Our story is Adam and Eve's story. We were hiding in the garden, making excuses for our sin, unable to cover up our shame. Our story is Jonah's story. We were running from God, denying our calling, surrounded by a raging sea. Our story is a prodigal son story. We were wasting our blessings, lost in our failures, too afraid to return home. Our story is Peter's story. We were unbelieving, full of fear and doubt, our faith slowly sinking beneath the waves. But that is not the end of our story. We are all longing to be restored. We want to stop running. We want to be found. We want to believe, and we are crying out for a savior. So God stepped in, into a broken world, into human form, into our very lives. God stepped into our mess, into our sin, into our failure, our fear, our doubt. He stepped into death, and the door shut behind him. And then he arose and left it all in the grave. He wiped clean our story and started writing a new one. One without shame, without fear, without death. A story full of love and forgiveness. A story of redemption and restoration. It's our life story. It's his story. It's a resurrection story. It's on? Yeah. We're on. You know, we were just mentioning, you know, every seems like every week there's a glitch here, a glitch there, but we said, you know what, when you're when you're producing a live show, these kinds of things are expected. Because even places like NBC and CBS, they can't get it right on their live shows. And we just have Vaughn. So <laughs> Wow. <laughs> no, not like that Vaughn is less. I just mean one person Vaughn. <laughs> 
Wow. All right. Well, it's all about the we are. We're, it's the timing. Punctuation is important. You couldn't see my punctuation in the way I was saying that. Um, we're going to start off with some online polls, which again is a brand new thing that we're going to try here, and uh, we'll see if it works. There's going to be five polls that are going to come, and they're going to come one after another. So you will only have a few seconds to vote on the poll, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some art pieces, and I am going to, uh, I am going to be interested in whether you uh, feel or believe that um, uh, art piece A or B is more art than the other one. They, they're both art, but which one, you as a critic, which one do you think is really art okay so right here in in this uh box here next to me is where they're going to show up and then uh we'll blow them up big so everybody can see them really well and then you will have a chance to to vote okay so uh we're going to pull up that poll right now and here's the first one so a you know who that is um you might say michael jackson i, know, I was gonna say that uh and b that is uh the mona lisa uh, I don't think that's the original. So, uh, which one do you think is more art? Okay, I know you're like, this is a bad choice. Well, you gotta pick one. You're the art critic, okay? All right, closing voting on that one. Open up poll number two. Another one, this is fan art. These are fans uh, that draw art of their fans. So who do we have here? A is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And B is... Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey. That's right. Jim Carrey, uh, he actually said he loves this one. He says it's just like him. So his mother couldn't tell them apart, apparently. Uh, Jim Carrey. So yeah, which one do you think is more art? All right. Let's see. Third one. Some strange photos here. Mickey Mouse and a duck smoking. I don't know. A or B, which one is more art? By the way, I did notice online you guys were kind of uh, kind of loving the, the camera on the keys. So that's kind of a cool little thing we tried. But, um, you know, we're trying new stuff. stuff. Some stuff crashes and burns. Other stuff works. So, yeah, you like that one. That's good. All right, next one. This is our, uh, uh, this is more traditional artwork. The fourth one here. Uh, so this is the Mona Lisa and Van Gogh's Starry Night. Listed as the number one and number two most famous art pieces on planet Earth, Mona Lisa being one and Van Gogh's Starry Night being number two. But which one do you think is more art? Realizing that whatever you put for this one, you're wrong. But Mona Lisa or Starry Night? We have one final one, which is more art. Michelangelo's David? Or Art Guzzi. <laughs> which Art, one? Didn't Art pose to be David? Yeah, Art was actually posing to be David. So which one is more Art? David or Art? And uh, I'll just publicly, I'm sorry, Art, that I used your likeness without your um, approval. But it just seemed to fit so well. And I think you would agree. So David or Art, which one is more Art? Um... All right, so in our polls, it looks like that worked pretty well. You guys were able to vote. Hopefully you had some fun with that. Looks like Mickey Mouse won his in a landslide. Uh, Van Gogh won, I agree, because the Mona Lisa, I get it. It's the number one most popular painting, and I just have to say why. When that's number one, I realize I don't know what art is, nor could I be a critic that would make sense. But at the same point, sometimes those movies that win the Academy Awards, it's amazing that the movie that wins it all, I never saw or I never even heard of. So, I don't know. There's a world out there that I don't quite get or understand. Because, you know, I always think, like, how come the zombie movie didn't win? Because that was a great movie, whatever that one happened to have been. Um, yeah. And apparently, yeah, Vaughn says, what about Tom Cruise movies? Yeah, because Tom Cruise, they're great movies. So, And apparently between uh, David's... Uh, 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 Michelangelo's David or Art Guzzi, Art wins in a landslide. So good job, Art. You're the winner. You're more Art than David. All right. First, uh, these four Sundays in May, we're going to be doing this new series called The Scarlet Thread of Redemption. 
And it is a theme that runs through the Bible from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. We have this scarlet thread of redemption where God is always in the process of redeeming his people, redeeming what um, uh, our fallen condition, redeeming situations along the way, and then ultimately we're working, looking forward to this final redemption. And even Jesus in his time here is a key piece of this redemptive plan that God has. And so every book of the Bible it weaves through, which is why in our, our logo you've got a line of Bibles with that red thread that seems to be going through each one of them, the, the, the scarlet thread of redemption. And it is a theme that is easy to see when you read the Bible. Just a basic reading of the Bible by anybody is going to come up with this theme of redemption. You, you see it play out over and over again, story after story, event after event, book after book. You see redemption. What is redemption? Redemption is the regaining of something that you've lost. And usually there's this payment for uh, in order to get what that is. That's how we redeem something. So think of like a coupon, right? You, you redeem a coupon when you use that to get what you need. So there's this, this uh, idea that you're getting something, you're paying something for it, you're giving something for it, and you're getting this thing in return. Or maybe think of a, a person who, or, or a business who maybe doesn't have the best of reputation. So they hire a new manager, they hire a new salesperson that is trying to redeem that um, reputation by working hard with customers and you know being the kind of business that people want that business to be so they can kind of redeem that reputation so it's, it's gaining back something that you have have lost um, the opening page of the Bible are a story of perfection as the Bible opens up we we see God creating and six days of creation, he creates everything that is not just the earth, but everything that's on the earth, and not just what's on the earth, but everything that is, including the vastness of our solar system, the universe, all created by God within this six-day um, cr uh, creation period. And in Genesis chapter 1, that's what you see, this whole creation piece happen. Genesis chapter 2, in fact, even in Genesis chapter 1, he creates man and, and woman, creates all of us. But in Genesis chapter 2... Uh, we pull out the man and woman piece from Genesis 1 and we focus on that in Genesis 2. And we, we learn a little bit about what, um, uh, you, you, uh, what, what creation uh, of humanity is like for men and women. And so once that takes place, then all of a sudden in chapter 3, well, men and women, they, they just throw it all away. Uh, all of a sudden, sin enters in. And as a sin enters in, there's a separation from God. And this is uh, illustrated through the story of Adam and Eve and the eating of the fruit and, and all that takes place after that. In fact, they realize in the process uh, of their sin that they are now naked, that they um, are unclothed. And so God, in his first act of redemption, uh, clothes them. Um, he takes animal skin and he clothes them. And uh, an animal is sacrificed in order to redeem this nakedness that they have. Genesis 3.21 says, And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. So this is the first time death happens for redemption. Animal is sacrificed for the covering of God's people. It is certainly a rich symbol of God's love and care for his people, but it's also the first of many sacrifices as it's going to require blood. It's going to require death and blood for people to, uh, to find this redemption that God is, is offering. So what we lost long ago is the same thing that you and I keep losing today. And we are in need of finding it. We're in need of being redeemed. You and me. What we did and what we continue to do is we reject our creator. We reject our creator, and as a result of that rejection, we have become separated from him. And now things like evil and hatred and pain and hurt and sorrow, and death and hopelessness rule the day. That seems to be what our world has to offer us. And God is the only one that can save us from these things. And that's what he offers us is this redemption, this saving from these things. We all need to be redeemed. See, the Bible is a book about that redemptive plan from Genesis through to Revelation. 
You see, this theme has profoundly impacted everyone who has read the Bible. Anyone who has come across and read the scriptures is profoundly impacted by this theme of redemption. And I think if you take the time to read the Bible, if you take the time to to just pour, let that pour into your life, you're going to hear and see that theme of redemption because it is a story of hope in the midst of what is hopeless. You see, this very same theme impacted my friend Jason Reiser. And he is our resident artist, creative, lighting guy, drummer dude, seminarian, well, and just our very good friend. And Jason was impacted, uh, and over a year ago, he started talking to me about an art piece that he wanted to create. And over this year, it has started taking shape, and it has started taking size. Because this art piece is going to be nearly 40 feet long, 35, 40 feet long. It is a huge piece of art, and it will have a permanent installation inside of Hillcrest. Um, It is filled with 20 custom art pieces that... Uh, Jason is uh, has created, and they're all done on actual papyrus. Um, it is a it is an amazing thing to see. The artwork is amazing, and it highlights redemption because it's a timeline of the Bible. And so during this series, we're taking four of those art pieces and talking about each one of those as a part of our series in talking about redemption. So we're going to use one of Jason's art pieces in each one of our services to highlight that and to illustrate that and to learn from as we look at what God has to say about the redemption uh, stories that these art pieces are created after. So each week during this series, um, I have asked Jason if he would start us off by telling us a little bit about the art piece and his inspiration behind it and maybe explaining a few things because you may not understand some of the symbolism that he has created as an artist uh, looking at these stories. So um, with the emojis down below, will you please welcome to the microphone, Jason Riser. Ooh, smiley faces flying by. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Far too good of an intro for a guy like myself. But um, I guess going off into this, yes, uh, a year ago, um, about there, I did approach Doug with this idea. And very interesting. Um, It evolved in many different ways. Um, But before we get into that, I'd like to kind of give you a little bit of a background, a briefing on myself and the actual style of art that um, that I've selected here. Um, started drawing at a young age. Uh, I remember vividly in my head, um, about the age of seven or eight, some really crude drawings of army soldiers throwing grenades and, uh, you know, typical GI Joe stuff for that age. At the age of 14, I don't know if anybody remembers, but there was commercial online or on TV actually, um, where you could purchase this drawing test. Um, I actually ordered that drawing test and I took it, uh, found out very quickly that I did have some abilities, um, Moved on after high school, uh, became an art major and a music major uh, probably five different times in my first three years of college. Um, Decided college wasn't for me. I entered the military in 1997, and upon exiting the military, decided to move on with my life and do other things. Um, I, in 2009, I returned to school with the idea of going through pre-med, and I only did it because people said I couldn't do it. very wrong reason for doing that. Uh, Became disgusted with the nursing program I was in just because I didn't like it. And so I entered into, uh, back into the world of art. And that is where I entered the graphic design program through the U of M Duluth on the Rochester campus. In 2011, I graduated with my bachelor's of fine arts in graphic design. My biggest focus was actually in studio art. Uh, The entire industry was leaning towards web design. I was strongly against that. 2017, I entered Sioux Falls Seminary, and here I stand today, where God has allowed me to combine my creative talents with my passion for for God and the Bible and and all that goes on within the seminary walls. A little bit about the art style. Um, The art style I've chosen is called stencil art. Stencil art's been around. uh, Chinese were some of the first recorded, about 150 A.D., and stencil art is a unique form. Uh, one of the most popularists out there right now is named Banksy. Uh, Banksy, the, he started this street art idea. 
Um, some very popular things out there if you want to look them up. Last name is spelled B-A-N-K-S-Y. Uh, check them out. Uh, very political on some sides. Uh, the satire and some of the uh, camaraderie within his works are rather amazing too. Um, <clears throat> he gained his notoriety through basically going out in the middle of the night and painting something on a wall. And people would wake up in the morning and see this there, and nobody knew who it was. To this day, he still tries to remain anonymous. However, he has been captured on photos. His art style captured my attention very quickly. The style of art that we're looking at here is not based so much on the painting itself. It's actually in the creation of the stencil that you use. The painstaking hours that went into this project. Um, <laughs> funny little side story here. When I chose to do 20 different art pieces, stencil art was like, hey, this will be quick. Spray them out, get them done. I quickly realized that uh, over 50 hours of hand cutting stencils was going to be rather um, unpleasant at times. So uh, anyways, moving into the art, um, we're going to go to the first piece here. The first piece is based on the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. And what I did with this, um, you can see here off to the side, uh, you want to blow that up big screen there Vaughn, we'll take a closer look. So this is on papyrus, like Doug said. Um, part of this is, the design here is to be like a book cover. Uh, you know, going over the beginning of all this. And <clears throat> with the layout of it, it's, it's got some hard edges. You'll notice that there's a lot of jaggedness to it. Um, that's kind of a representation of the, the way that we move through the Torah and some of the rough um, stories that are within there. When I first started reading the Bible, I was very astonished at the grim nature of some of the books and some of the stories that we read in Genesis. Uh, moving through this, we're going to actually kind of take a little bit closer look at different elements here. The first one we're going to move into here, if we can zoom in a little bit there. On the left side there, you'll notice a zebra print. Um, the zebra print here is a representation from the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve do take the bite of that fruit. They disobeyed God. They were just covered in shame. Uh, God comes back to the Garden of Eden and is shouting for them, asking them to answer. And when they do not answer, they're hiding from their shame. Part of it was because they were naked. Uh, this, for me, when I started researching the redemption idea behind the Scarlet Thread, was very interesting because... You try to figure out where did it all start. Um, in the animal print that you see here, it started with a sacrifice that God made for us through sacrificing his own creation, one of the animals, so that he could clothe Adam and Eve. So thus the zebra print is on there. The next spot moving across, we're going to look at the bread brush stroke, um, which we can bring that up again if we want. Otherwise, uh, everybody I think there can see that. With, with the red brush stroke there at the top. Uh, this is a representation, I'm sure everybody can guess, of the Passover and the idea of trying to save your firstborn. Um, the Passover was a very significant time, um, taking place in the book of Exodus, obviously. And this for me was just kind of obvious. Um, the paint I chose for this, I actually used an airbrush paint. Uh, this airbrush paint is... Um, it's by a company called Createx, and it's actually called Blood Red. Um, it's designed with the idea of looking like blood when it is applied. And a little hard to see in the video version of it, uh, but when you see it in person, um, it is transparent and opaque, just like blood. Moving down through this, you're going to see some written text. The words, I am who I am. And in the center of the O, you have Yahweh. Uh, there is also, if we zoom, there we go to the large shot, we can see up the side there of the jagged triangle on the bottom, there's going to be a couple different versions of Yahweh. These are representations of God as our provider, God as our righteousness, and the God who is always there for us. As we move across on the bottom of the screen there, you're going to notice the goat and the handprint. And bring that one up. We'll just zoom right in on that right away. Um, that's, every artist kind of puts their own little spin on things. That is my actual handprint. 
So I had to make the goat larger than life because my hands were so big. But uh, what's really interesting with this, I was really captivated by the story of the scapegoat. Uh, one of the goats, there was two goats. One of the goats would be sacrificed and then the other would be used as a scapegoat, which would be released into the wilderness. One of the things that's more grim about this, it was covered in blood. And this was from the sacrifice of the first goat. So the representation of the goat and the handprint is there. Moving on to the bone. The bone is also representative of the Passover with the Passover meal. It's also a representation of Christ who is to come later on, as we all know in the Bible. The idea behind the bone is, is that it's unbroken. The bones of Christ were unbroken when he was crucified. The, uh, those participating in the Passover meal were required to leave the bones unbroken. They were not to damage uh, anything when they were eating. And then the final element is going to be the wings. Uh, the wings are unique. Uh, there's one that's really pretty and frilly, one that's a little bit more bat-like, a little more gruesome. And this is a representation of the choice that God has given us, the choice that we have to select between blessings and curses, between good and evil. What is our choice going to be? So um, I give this to you, the Torah. Uh, absolute fun in all of this. We are going to open this up for questions and stuff. I do see a lot of comments coming in. Um, I am going to respond to those, if not during the service message here. I will respond to them later on today or throughout the week as we go through Facebook. But with that, we'll give it back over to Doug and bring him back up for uh, the lesson. Thank you, Jason. Woo! -hoo. Yeah, give your emojis. Um, yeah, it's going to be a really cool installation, and looking forward to that. Uh, when we come back into this facility uh, at some point in the future, uh, we will have uh, kind of an unveiling of that. It should be a really cool, uh, cool experience uh, for all of us. So um, he's worked hard on this, and the art pieces are truly, truly amazing. Now. So for those of you that have been with me for any length of time, realize that I think a little bit, I say I think differently, but at the same point, some may say I think strangely or oddly or even, I don't know, annoyingly, but I say I think differently about things. And this has become uh, extremely apparent, apparent for those of you that have been a part of Hillcrest Live the last couple of weeks, because definitely some interesting things there as I've been thinking about. But um, the art piece that Jason has created focuses on, uh, the one that we looked at today is focusing on the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. But the question as I look at that is I say, look, why? So why are those five books called the Torah? And what is the Torah? Um, what are we supposed to do with the Torah? And if these five books are something called the Torah, why doesn't your Bible or my Bible delineate those five books as something unique or different or call that the Torah? So what is this and what are we supposed to do with this? Um, and is the Torah, since it's a biblical item, we should be doing something with it? So the question to start with is, what is the Torah? Well, the Torah is a, is a Hebrew word. The word Torah is Hebrew, and it means teaching or instruction. So the Torah is the instruction. The Torah was used by the Jewish people. Um, it was a focus of theirs, and it was something that they, um, uh, that they use and still today use in the synagogue. They read the Torah up to four times during uh, the week. And they read the Torah over an entire year that starts with the Jewish New Year and goes all the way a year until the next beginning of the Jewish New Year, which is a two-day celebration that they have. They, uh, they teach that God gave Moses the Torah, the, these five books, on Mount Sinai. And that's where the Torah came from, and they've been using it ever since. So that's kind of what the Torah is or, you know, what we understand it to be and how the Jewish people have been teaching on it. But Moses, as you well know, and if you think of his story, you can see that Moses is a redeemer. He is someone that God sent to redeem his people. This is, again, that important theme of redemption that is throughout the scriptures. Uh, as he, uh, as the story reveals um, and, and the work of Moses as a redeemer is revealed, uh, God then continues to redeem his people. 
Uh, redeemed not only as they escaped Egypt and crossed the Red Sea and go into the desert to escape Pharaoh and the armies, redeems the people there, but then the redemption going into the promised land, and again, story after story after story. But Moses, when it all starts off, Moses sees this burning bush in the distance, and he goes up to this burning bush, and at this burning bush is where God says, basically, he says, you're going to redeem the people, like you're going to be the redeemer. And Moses has all kinds of issues and questions, but one of the questions he, he has, it comes from Exodus 3.14. Because he said, who do I say you are? Like, if I'm going to go do this thing, who, who's my authority? And so God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am, at, uh, I am has sent me to you. So that's this uh, I am uh, issue or the, the redemptive piece where he says, this is who I am. So you tell them, God sent you. God is going to be your redeemer. So God is the redeemer sends Moses to be the leader, to lead the people to the place of redemption that God has for them. Now, the people, of course, were a stubborn crew, but in the end, God redeems them. And it seems like God is always doing his redemptive work against our efforts to somehow thwart that redemptive work that we desperately need. The Torah contains 613 commandments. They also say that there are 613 little seeds inside of a pomegranate. Which is why many times in Jewish art, you'll see a pomegranate that represents the 613 uh, Jewish laws contained within the Torah. Ten of those are the most well-known, and we call those the Ten Commandments. They're part of the 613. And the purpose of the law, like the whole reason why the law existed, was to prove to people that they could not keep the law. You couldn't keep all 613 laws perfectly. You were going to mess up. You were going to fail somewhere along the way. You were going to need to be redeemed. You couldn't do it on your own. You needed a redeemer. So the Torah is a real part of the Bible. It is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as we have written. That is the Torah. But the thing is, is that the Torah today cannot be fulfilled. You cannot do the laws of the Torah and fulfill them because, well, there's some real practical reasons. One, there's no temple. So you can't do the sacrifices. There's no priesthood. There's no Levites that... You know, run the temple and the, the priests, uh, those holy priests. So there's no temple, um, there's no priest. Uh, at the same point, there is no theocracy form of government, which is required under this Torah law. So we can't even keep the Torah law the way that it's written because these things don't exist. So why is it that Christians don't really talk about this or observe these things within the Torah? Or why don't Christians use the Torah in a very distinct way? The reason is because Jesus, Jesus abolished the law. All 613, he abolished them. And he set up from the old covenant of God with his people, he set up a new covenant with his people. But the thing is, is that the new, covenant, the new covenant with Jesus is even harder to keep than the old one. See, the old covenant, covenant one of the laws was do not murder. Well, I don't know about you, that is an easy one for me. I'm just... It's not like I go through my day and I'm like, you know what? I, I had a great day today. I didn't murder anybody. It's not like I really struggle with that, you know? It's not like that's something that, you know, I want to do. So for me, do not murder. I got 612 others that may be hard to do, but that one is an easy one for me. I'm not going to murder anyone. But what did Jesus say about murder? In the New Covenant, Jesus says, if you hate your brother and sister, if you have hateful thoughts towards someone, same as murder. You have now committed murder. Well, that one's maybe not so easy for me to keep. I've committed murder many times if that's the new covenant way. So the old covenant we couldn't keep. Jesus sets up the new covenant, abolishes the old law, sets up the new covenant, which is even harder now to keep. And none of us can do it. We all still need a redeemer. We cannot do it on our own. See, the old covenant was a covenant of blood, bloodshed, animal sacrifice in order to, to cover the sins of the people. The new covenant is also a covenant of blood. It's still going to require blood. And it's the blood of Jesus that covers our sin. It points all the way back to the, the Jewish Passover feast. It was called the Passover because it was a, the celebration of the time in which uh, God saved his people and sent this, this angel that would, if you weren't part of God's group, if you weren't on God's side, if you weren't on God's team, 
this angel would take the life of your firstborn son. But anyone that had the blood of a lamb that was sacrificed and put over the doorpost of the house, those people would be saved, would pass over their house. So redemption possible through the blood of a lamb, shed blood of a lamb, to redeem people. And the Passover meal was a time that they remembered this and they celebrated it. Exodus 12, 13 says, But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses which you are staying. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This was part of what God used in order to get the, the people out of Egypt, uh, away from Pharaoh, and to redeem them and bring them to the promised land. And the, the Passover celebration was that moment when Jesus decided, as he celebrated, they did once a year. Uh, Jewish people still today celebrate their, the Passover meal one time a year. And at that very sacred, special meal that Jesus had with his disciples, because if you didn't know it, Jesus was Jewish, um, as, long, as well as his disciples. So at the Passover meal, as they were having it, as good Jewish men would, it is at that moment that Jesus decided to tell them that the new covenant was there. And that that new covenant was going to require sacrifice and shedding of blood, but that it would be the sacrifice of his body. And it would be the shedding of his blood. And he did that with two elements, cup, wine, and bread, symbolizing the body. And after he did this with the disciples, he said, now do this, uh, and when you do this, do it to remember me. Do it to remember the sacrifice. So the Passover, the redemptive work of God, Jesus used that to illustrate a new covenant that was coming and how that new covenant would be his body and his blood shed for all mankind. No longer an animal, but he would be the lamb of God and his blood would be shed for the world. So this is where Jesus brings us to. So we don't follow the Torah because we're under a new covenant. And in this new covenant, uh, it is a sacrifice that has already been made by Jesus that covers us in our own sin. Uh, from our sins, and, and washes us white as snow. The new covenant, Jesus is saying that he will save us from the penalty of the law. He will redeem us. So for Christians, the focus is on the new covenant, which is salvation through Jesus. And we illustrate that through baptism. We identify with his death, and we come up out of the waters, identify with the resurrection. We do it through remembering, through communion. And we also do it through celebrating, through worship. And we worship on the seventh day of the week, on Sunday, the day that, of the week that Jesus resurrected. And so even uh, followers of Jesus switched their day from Saturday to Sunday because it was so significant that Jesus rose on Sunday. Redemption has always been there, from the beginning all the way through to today. It has always been a part of God's plan for us to redeem us as his people. Redemption in the Old Covenant was secured through the sacrifice and the blood of an animal. But the new covenant is secured through the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, and the blood that he shed on the cross. So I'm going to invite our worship team to come on up at this point. As one of the things that we, we want to understand as we close our, our, our service here is that redemption is... Here. Redemption is now. Redemption isn't something we have to wait for. It's not something of the future. It is here and it is now. And God has always provided a way for you and I to get out of this mess. He has always been a part of, of understanding that we're the ones that broke it through our sin at the very beginning. And that we continue to break it in generations past. But he has always been a part of redeeming his people. Even though we continue to make redemption necessary, he continues to work on redemption. You see, the question today is not whether you are redeemed. The question is not whether redemption is, is available to you. The question is, will you choose to be redeemed? Redemption is there. Redemption is offered. But have you chosen it? Because for you and me, Blood will be required to redeem us from our sins. Blood is required. And it's either going to be the result of our own death and eternal separation from God, or it will be because we have allowed the substitute sacrifice of Jesus 
the blood of the lamb to cover our sin. It's either going to be we're going to pay for it or we're going to trust that God has already paid it for us. God said it this way, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He said, today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. And now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Words written long ago, poignant and needed for today, because the choice still exists for us, whether we choose to be redeemed or not. The choice is here today, whether we choose or not, to tap into the redemption that's made, been made available to you and to me. Because God has made salvation available to you. He's made salvation av available to me. He's made it available to everyone. God has always been there for you. He always will be there for you. And he promises that he will never leave you. He also says that if you follow him, if you live for him, that he has a plan, and it's a good plan. It's a plan where he will do amazing things through your life. And you will be able to do great things in his name. But the choice always has been and always will be ours to make. You see, love is not found in forcing someone. Love is not found in manipulation. Love is always found in choice. In fact, I don't think you can define love properly without choice being a key part of it. Love is a choice that we make. We choose to love. That's what makes love, love, to choose. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the hope that we can have in the resurrection. And so, Lord, as we enter into an understanding of redemption, and as we look, uh, even this month, at how redemption plays out uh, page after page in your story, may that redemption live out page after page in our own lives. That it may be a testimony, that it may be um, a truth, that it may be something that we can communicate and live out, but it's also something that we can embrace and hold on to and draw close to, knowing that we on our own are broken and that on our own we are far from you, but, but as we tap into who you are, forgiveness is possible. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your hope. We thank you for the redemption we can have in you. In Jesus' name.
Jason, great job doing our worship today. Uh, that concludes our service here. We have one week until Mother's Day. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, so hopefully you have prepared and you're ready for that. I know Mother's Day is going to be really different this year than it has in years past, but you can do some things for this Mother's Day that maybe you weren't able to uh, any other year because of that. So be creative, figure out ways to care for and to love on your moms um, because it is their special uh, day next week. Next week we also are going to be continuing our um, Scarlet Thread of Redemption. We're going to be looking at the character of Ruth, which is a great one for Mother's Day too with Naomi and that whole scene. So you can read ahead and kind of catch up and uh, be ready for us next week. Read that story of Ruth. Uh, you can find it in the, well, in the book of the Bible called Ruth. That's a pretty easy one to find. So uh, hopefully you have an amazing week. We've got a lot of stuff uh, happening here uh, around Hillcrest and we'll be doing a lot of different kinds of things online. Uh, and again, whether it's Wednesday night or Thursday night with Hillcrest Live, uh, we've got opportunities for you to connect and enjoy a little bit too. God bless you all. Thanks for being a part of our service. That does it for us. We're out. Thanks.